Uh, but today is uh, very easy because I mean, you already, uh, everybody knows I think, uh, Bruno. He has been here almost uh, for three years and something now, probably. Three years and a half. Yes, and a half. Okay. No, so he will finish the. It sounds kind of a threat yes. there. But yeah, <laughs> uh, you, you have, uh, as you will see, he has the material for finishing, so I think he will finish. And, uh, and also the. Um, well, I mean, he came from uh, from Rome. Uh, you were in, in Las Pizza, in Laurea, and after that he came to do the, the PhD. Uh, started with the three projects, and uh, after that he got the the kind of business internships, and this is what he's. Uh, uh, so well, I mean, then the, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. So, <coughs> good afternoon, to everybody. Now, as you can see from the title, we're going to talk about airport networks. More specifically, we're going to talk about delays in airport networks and propagation of delays. So usually I start this kind of talks with a um, bit of introduction and motivation. And I do realize that it's not the most fun thing in the universe, but we have to talk about money a bit just to understand the magnitude of the problem. Uh, so here I have a few references with the costs of delay in the US and in Europe. Uh, of course, you see that the numbers are quite different. Uh, the reason is that they are measuring different things. Uh, the US ones uh, are also measuring things that costs that fall on the passengers, uh, impact on the GDP, and things like that. Uh, these two actually are measuring uh, the same thing, uh, and they come to rather different conclusions. So this is also to give you an idea that even assessing the cost of delay is quite a big uh, I mean, it's a science in itself. Uh, so the problem is, at least from the financial point of view, huge, and it's getting worse, of course. Uh, more figures. Uh, actually, air transportation is the transportation mode that in the last century has seen the fastest growth of any other transportation mode. Uh, as you might expect, there was a small slowdown right after 9-11, but it's growing, it's growing fast, and upgrading the relevant infrastructure uh, is quite hard and you know that if you live near uh, the airport so this is the this is the beginning let's say now i have to introduce uh, an important definition so we can divide delay into primary and reactionary it is reactionary if it is propagated from one flight to another otherwise we call it primary and of course uh, propagation of delay happens when one flight has to be has to wait for another one before it can start and we will see in a moment uh, what are the kind of mechanisms that generate this kind of thing uh, we know that actually reactionary delays are a big part of the problem they're about 40 60 percent uh, of the total well actually 40 60 percent is my own estimate uh, for the US uh, because there is no official data. 50% uh, is the estimate for Europe. So a large part of the delay is things that come from other flights. And uh, okay, what we're going to do about it. So here I have like a small overview of our approach. So the idea is that we do simulations, agent-based simulations. Uh, the idea is that we want to reconstruct as much as possible of the system so the inputs of the simulation from real data I will talk about that later uh, and as the output of the simulation we want to know what are the primary delays which are generated and from where to where they were propagated uh, at this point I should note that uh, the scale of the simulation Temporarily, we simulate one day of traffic at the time. Uh, this is sensible because there is very little propagation of delay between one day and the other because airports close during the night, so there is no traffic. Uh, and the scale is, uh, this is quite important because it, it is uh, the one new thing in what we are doing, probably. The scale is system-wide. So we adopt a simplified model, but because it is simple, we can do it system-wide, so for all Europe or all the US. Uh, okay, so if you build a model that is supposed to reproduce the spreading of delays, uh, 
there are two things that you can do with it. Uh, one is the obvious one. You see if the model works, if, you see if it's predictive. So you can try to reconstruct what happens in reality from your initial conditions. Uh, the other thing that you can do is run uh, case studies, which essentially means what is going to happen, say, if I close one airport, what is the impact on the network, uh, and, uh, and things like that. What is the impact of uh, airline strategies, uh, etc. In this talk, we will focus actually on a case study. Uh, in the abstract, I promise that I would show the, also the first part, but I have to cut it because I don't have enough time. But there is a reference, it, uh, it has been published. So if someone is interested in the process of uh, validation, uh, confusion matrices, uh, and all that stuff, you can, it exists, you can find it there. OK, so now that this is idea, uh, we can actually describe the model. Uh, and well, of course, if we want to simulate air traffic, uh, the first thing that we need to know is the flights. So we need, as an input, the scheduled traffic day by day. And each entry, each flight in this data set has to have the following information. Uh, this is rather obvious, so we need the scheduled arrival and departure times, uh, delays, uh, where it's coming from and when it's going. Uh, we need to identify the aircraft uh, uh, in a unique way. And also we need to you know the airline that is operating the flight and why those things are needed uh, is going to become clear very soon. Uh, the data that we are using, this data, uh, comes from the Flight Radar 24 web service. Now, I assume most of you know it, but in case you don't, uh, this is the kind of stuff that uh, the website does. Uh, the good question is, uh, OK, why are you using this source rather than uh, a more official, uh, high quality, whatever one? Uh, the reason, of course, is that the official source is something that you don't have, not we. In general, you cannot have this kind of data for Europe. You can have it for the US, but for Europe, you cannot have, at least at the scale of one year, two years of data, you cannot have this for Europe. So we are forced, quotation marks, uh, to use the data that we gather from Flight Radar 24. The coverage is actually quite good. So up to 20k flights in the US per day and uh, 18k uh, in Europe. It's free. The only thing that you need to do is uh, ask permission. It's a matter of sending an email. Uh, we, were, we were quite happy about that. And we have been collecting data for almost two years. And of course, when I say we, I actually mean that Antonia has been collecting data for almost two years. But so now we have a sample size that is uh, quite big, so this means that we can uh, also do something in a more systematic way. Uh, can I ask a question? Sure. Just in order to have an idea of what is the coverage, do you know how it's 16 to 18 k? Uh, should be, uh, I think it should be something like 70%. Uh, the missing coverage can depend on several factors. One is that not every aircraft has a transponder that is picked up by flight radar. Uh, and the other is that sometimes you have data inconsistencies that you have to cut. Uh, I mean, uh, these figures are after the data has been cleaned. So in that case, we can get like uh, 70%. It's worse than the official sources, but not that much worse. I mean, you cannot get 100% coverage even if you look at the official sources. And what is with the other 30% of the flights? They are not covered by Flight 24? Or yeah, they're not covered. Uh, well, some cannot be covered. You're not going to find the uh, Air Force One in there. <laughs> or military flights uh, or things like that. So that's one part. Uh, then you have the data inconsistencies that we fix. And uh, yes, the fly, uh, there is the built-in thing of the limited coverage. No, you also have cargo, cargo flights. They don't have uh, passengers. They are not considered as sources. And uh, in this case, the schedule is a little but I think they are not even covered in the official data. No, no, they are not in the, in the official data. It's usually around 60-something percent, 70 percent of the total total uh, traffic in, the, in Europe. Uh, because, I mean, they are more related to performance of flights, so they say they are interested in that situation. And, uh, and here you get a 5-6 percent less. And performance is why you cannot get the official data. 
because they don't want us to like uh, write a paper saying uh, this airline uh, is really terrible at managing delays. But you would also not have any reactionary delays, for example, based on carbon flights, right? Yeah. Uh, yes, but it's uh, well, it will be clear probably more after the presentation, but. Uh, I don't think there can be much propagation between uh, cargo flight, if any, between cargo flights and passenger flights. Uh, because essentially they don't have any reason to wait for one another. Uh, yes, there is a way. Just make the point here. For the US, you have the official and the, and the radar. And the, yes. So the difference between the coverage is, you say, 6% or what is the difference? Well, uh, yes. Yeah, I mean, the number that 6% is. Uh, with one day of data that we had. Uh, no, no, but I mean, I did also more systematic. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But in the US, yeah, they were more systematic. Yeah. But also, the official data in the US is not the full story. Uh, so. uh, but the, the US data does not have intercontinental flights, the official data. So this is another uh, point of interest. I mean, the intercontinental flights are something we can only get from flight data or similar sources. Okay, uh, so now there is one question that I should answer and how do we know if delay is primary or reactionary? Because of course the primary is to be the input of the simulation. Uh, the reactionary is something that we cannot put in. Uh, we have to recreate it and see if it is correct. Now, uh, the thing is uh, there is uh, actually no way of knowing for sure officially which delay is reactionary and which delay is primary. So we take uh, this approach. Uh, you might think that it's a bit arbitrary, but it is consistent with what little we know from the official sources. Uh, and it works in the sense that if we select the delays this way, try to calibrate the simulation with the input constructed in this way, uh, it works. If we try similar uh, different criteria, it doesn't. So uh, at least for me, that's a decent argument. But the idea is that uh, if one flight is the first in a rotation, so we assign a ranking to all of them, and we pick the ones with the lowest ranking. Uh, if a flight is the first one in a rotation, uh, my bad, I should define this word. Uh, a rotation is the series of the, of the movements of the flights one aircraft does uh, during the day. So if it's the first movement, uh, a flight does uh, during the day, we also we always consider it primary. Uh, otherwise, uh, we say that the probability of, of being a primary is higher if uh, uh, delay is increased with respect to the previous flight. So the idea is that if the day is the pre if my previous flight was delayed and now I am recovering delay, uh, then probably it, it, it's because the delay is being propagated from the other one. If delay, if delay is increasing, since you cannot propagate more delay than what you have, uh, then it means that it's been creating during this flight, so we consider it primary. Uh, and like I said, if you select the 60% uh, flights with this kind of thing, you get the amount of primary delay and reactionary delay that is consistent with what we know from the official data. Excuse me, you consider only one plane? Uh, it's always one plane, or you also consider that plane can wait for a different plane to arrive? Uh, no, in this thing, I will talk about that later, but in this thing, it's only uh, the delays of a single aircraft. Single aircraft. So, how is delay propagated? Uh, we can, I mean, we have three basic mechanisms. Uh, these three are all implemented in the simulation. Uh, of course. Uh, so the first thing is that if two flights are operated by the same aircraft, of course, uh, the second one must wait for the first. Uh, there is not really much choice. It's physically impossible to depart. Uh, you might need to wait for connecting passengers, so passengers that are coming from another flight. Uh, you can abandon them, so you can say, OK, I don't care. Uh, you have to refund them, but you can do it. Uh, and then you might need to wait crew members that are coming from a different aircraft. Uh, uh, this last mechanism, we have it in the simulation, but uh, it's something for which there is very little data available and it has a small impact. So I will leave it out of this presentation. You can pretend it doesn't exist. Uh, the interesting thing 
of the passengers. So uh, the idea is that we don't know how many passengers there are on each flight, uh, and uh, we don't know what each passenger is doing. So we have to do it in a probabilistic way. This means that there is a component of uh, stochasticity of the simulation. So we have to run uh, multiple realization and then aggregate the results. So, but the idea is that on each flight, we put 100 passenger, fixed number. Uh, and then at the beginning of each simulation, we let them form connections. So uh, in this case, I have this example. So there is one flight arriving at one airport. Uh, we look into the future and we say that uh, there is another flight that is departing, but it's too early. The passenger doesn't have enough time to go from one aircraft to the other, so this is discarded. We have a time window of, in which we can do connections, and in there we find three different flights. So the idea is that we will have three different probabilities of going to this, this, or this. These are obtained from actual data, more on that in a moment. And of course, you also have the probability of not doing a connection. Maybe you are also uh, already arrived at your final destination. So the, these probabilities of connection, uh, we take them from data that we have acquired from a US company called uh, Sabre. Unfortunately, this is uh, as non-open as possible. It costs money. Uh, we cannot share it. Uh, and maybe, I don't know, maybe some of you have a problem with that, but essentially uh, this kind of thing, you either do it this way or you don't do it at all. So we have these uh, probabilities which are obtained by passenger fluxes. And we might think of doing, of simply doing the connections in this way. So essentially you end up with a multinomial process where each passenger is a different trial. This uh, for each flight that has to establish connections. Uh, unfortunately, it's not going to always work if you do it like this uh, for two reasons. One is that, in reality, you're not forced to always wait for the passengers. Uh, I know personally some of that. Uh, the other is that the, the data that we have is aggregated at the monthly level. Aggregated at the monthly level means that, yes, it's good, but there can be variations day by day. So we introduce uh, this parameter alpha and uh, essentially it goes between uh, minus one and plus one and essentially it's something that we use day by day to modulate increase or decrease the probabilities uh, to take this fact into account uh, uh, this is actually the only free parameter of the model so this is the thing that you have to fit in order to get uh, agreement between simulation and real data more on that uh, I mean briefly the idea is that when alpha is minus one, we remove the connections completely. And of course, uh, if you do a fit and you find that the good value of alpha is minus one, it means that you have a problem. Uh, everybody's connecting when alpha is equal one, one, and if alpha is zero, we are using the connections as they are in the data. Uh, ideally, we'd like this to be close to zero, and uh, when we try to repeat this exercise over many days, what we found is that the median value is actually close to zero. And uh, I, mean, I mean, if you want, you can calibrate this over many days, find one that is a best fit uh, overall for all the sample. And at that point, you can use, uh, I mean, you can use another without any parameter. I mean, you add it with the overall best alpha and you can use it to do predictions or whatever. Uh, this is something I will not go into the details of uh, because it's boring, but there is another way indirect of propagating delay from one flight to the other. And uh, essentially, airspaces and uh, airports have uh, finite capacity. So you cannot have, of course, how many flights you want occupying the same airspace, occupying, uh, trying to use the same runway and things like that. Uh, so if two flights want to land, for example, at a given airport at some point in time, we are not simulating the airspace section, actually, but if you have two flights that are competing to land at the same place and there is only room for one, we have to decide 
which one gets them first and which other is going to be delayed. Uh, this is actually where one difference between the US and European system comes into play. Uh, all you need to know for the sake of this talk is that uh, we use a strategy of first come, first served in the US and first plan, first serve in Europe. Uh, the details, these are quite complicated because uh, people in this field uh, really love if you put a uh, lot of details and of course because if you want to say that the impact is small, you have to prove it somehow. Uh, but the idea that I'm not going into the detail of this, uh, you will trust me hopefully when I say that the impact is small. Of course, it's small in this context. Uh, if I'm trying to simulate what happens if I reduce to 20% of the nominal value the capacity of uh, Heathrow Airport, which is something that we have done, by the way, of course, uh, this thing is not going to be valid anymore, obviously. But we are not doing that right now. Uh, this concludes the definition, uh, the, the explanation of what we are doing in the model. Uh, so now we'll talk about uh, one application, the latest one that we have done. I will drink and then talk. And in this case, what we want to do is to look at what is the impact of intercontinental flights. Now, uh, what I mean by impact is something, of course, that I'm going to define. But I mean, this thing was to us interesting uh, because, like I said before, uh, intercontinental flights uh, are not something that you can find in the official sources. Because, of course, if you go to the website of the Bureau of Transportation Statistics of the United States of America, uh, they're not going to care about European flights. They only have domestic flights. Uh, so this is uh, actually a way of putting the data from Flight Color 24 to good use. Uh, OK, what we want to, how we define this impact. So the idea is that, first, this is a case study. So I'm not going to try to replicate what happens in, uh, in reality. I'm trying to put the system in a weird condition, and I'm trying to see how it reacts. In this particular case, uh, what we do is that we set all the primary delays in the system to zero. So everything should happen without any problem. And then we put a huge amount of delay on a single flight. Uh, the idea is not that, in reality, you will see a delay propagation tree, which I'm going to describe in a moment, uh, like this. In reality, if, if one flight suffers a huge amount of delay, uh, the airline is going to do something to prevent this kind of catastrophe from happening. So before someone uh, sues me, I'm not claiming that uh, airlines uh, can cause catastrophes. Uh, the idea is that the model that we have is a model of normal operations. I mean, it does not take into account huge perturbations. So when we use it in this case, uh, essentially we're saying that if you play by the book, let's say, in this situation, this kind of damage will happen. So this can be considered a measure of how badly you need to, uh, to change your strategy. And of course, in reality, this uh, depends on uh, the strategy of the airline, the costs which are involved, and usually will involve things like uh, canceling flights, uh, uh, canceling connections, uh, restructuring the schedule, uh, maybe taking one spare aircraft uh, uh, that you may have in one of your hubs, uh, uh, but of course these are things that uh, are extremely ad hoc, so we cannot really we cannot really model them. Uh, so we put a huge amount of delay to one flight. We look at the resulting propagation, and uh, well, you end up with the string. So a link means that there is uh, one flight between this airport and this other which was delayed. Uh, this happens in the simulation, so we have complete control over that, uh, so these links are actual, actually causal relationships. I mean, if uh, I have this flight here and these four flights uh, here, for example, I know for sure, because I have control over it, 
that this four were delayed by this one. Uh, there are several features we, uh, we can measure about this kind of thing. Uh, we are focusing mainly on two. That is the total delay of this thing and the number of edges, so the number of affected flights. Uh, maybe in the future we will do also more complicated things. Uh, depends on how interesting they get, but this, uh, uh, this is the idea. Now, where, when and where we are doing this thing? Uh, we took a sample of 24 schedules. So we are doing 24 simulation from 24 days. Uh, in 12 of them, we are considering flights from US to Europe and the, the propagation in the European system. Clearly, uh, for one day, you have to run one sim different simulation from every intercontinental flight. Uh, and then in the other, we have also the, the other way around the US uh, The idea, OK, we are choosing the days so that they are good. So we don't want things we cannot model, like I said, into the, into the system. And we want days where the coverage is sufficiently good. Once we have that, uh, we can do the calibration that I spoke about uh, before. So uh, here, in order to calibrate the model, we are tweaking the alpha parameter. Actually, we have, uh, in this case, we are using three of them, but it's exactly the same thing. So we are considering, when here, internal means inside the system, US or Europe. Outgoing and incoming are the intercontinental flights that are going out of the system or are coming into the system. Uh, so we have different, uh, three different values of alpha for the, the different kind of passenger connections. And uh, we calibrate by fitting this curve. So this is the total cumulative delay. It is not, it is not the only thing, uh, the, the only choice you can do, but it's something which is easy to explain, everybody understands it, so we like it. Uh, this is not, of course, the only thing about the system that you, I mean, the only information about the system that you can recover from the simulation. Uh, and as before, in the references that I gave you before, uh, there are also other things uh, such as predictions at the flight level and, uh, and stuff like that. Uh, this kind of fit is good. I chose the picture because it is good. Uh, we do have a good fit in most of the, no, actually in all of the days that we are used for this particular exercise. Uh, but uh, I like to point out that uh, we don't have a good fit. In, we cannot, by definition, have a good fit for every possible day of data. Because in some days, there are going to happen problems. Uh, and problems are things that you can only model if you know beforehand what happened. Uh, if an airport explodes, well, it's going to be in the news. But if you have an airport that is completely shut down, and for some reason you don't see it in the news, uh, then it's impossible to recover what is happening. Because you would need an uh, additional initial condition and you're nodding about it. Uh, by the way, there is a paper on this topic, uh, not by me, it was done by Pablo Verkin, which most of you know, uh, precisely on this topic. So you have a model of this kind, what do you do in case you have an external perturbation that is not included and you want to still, uh, still model the thing? It was about uh, bad weather in that case. Okay, so. This is the idea. One final uh, remark before showing finally some result. Uh, there is actually, if you do uh, this kind of exercise, so you don't consider the system as it happens in reality, but you want to look at the impact of a single flight, uh, you have to be careful about the built-in delays in the schedule. What does this mean? It means that even if you put all the primary delays to zero, uh, you can still have reactionary delays being generated because actually I should go back I mean like uh, I showed here it's not enough 
that the previous flight arrives before the next one in order to avoid the propagation of delay. You also need a buffer time between the two flights, which can be the time for transferring the passengers, which is 45 minutes, by the way, or the time for doing the aircraft-related operation, so unloading the passengers, uh, refueling, uh, and things like that. Uh, in our simulation, this is uh, 30 minutes, and uh, I mean, we spoke with people in the in the industry, and it's uh, quite representative of of what's happening. So essentially, what happens is that airlines can uh, structure the schedule in such a way that the buffer times are very, very small, less than 30 minutes. Uh, and I have to say, uh, sometimes we also saw negative, I won't name any airline, but sometimes we also saw negative buffer times in the schedules, means that in the schedule, you find that this aircraft is going to arrive at, I don't know, 15? The next flight is departing at uh, 14.45. At the beginning, we discarded those flights because we thought, OK, this uh, has obviously to be a problem. But speaking uh, with people who know more than us about these things, uh, uh, they told us, no, they do that. Uh, well, not going into the details, but uh, as you can imagine, there are lots of perverse incentives in place, but they do that. So, the problem is that you end up, when doing your simulation, uh, with some delay that is generated, but we don't want it, because we only want the impact of the flight that we are considering. Uh, so the idea is that basically we also run a simulation with absolutely zero delays. We look at what is generated there, and then we subtract it from the impact of the, from the, impact of the flights that we are calculating. So, in this way, uh, we know that uh, what we are calculating is actually, positively, the impact of that flight. Uh, now, we look at the, uh, the results for, for this. And here, there is one thing that is uh, immediately striking. The blue dots are the flights going from US to Europe. Uh, here, I have put ICAC, means uh, European Civil Aviation Conference, because that's what people in the, in the field like. In red, we have flights going from Europe to US, and we see that uh, the blue ones have much, much bigger impact. I mean, the top ones are almost uh, five times the top ones going in the opposite direction. So once we see this thing, it's clear that uh, we have to ask uh, why this is happening. Uh, we are, actually, we do know. So, in order to figure out what is happening, uh, here I have a couple of tables. So here, for each day that we have simulated in both, uh, in both directions, I have selected the top three flights with the uh, highest impact in terms of uh, delay induced. Uh, you will, first we look at this ones, so European flights going to the US. And this one is completely unsurprising in the sense that you see here I have the destination airport and you see that pretty much all of them are going to Atlanta. And this makes perfect sense. Atlanta is the largest airport in the world. It's a big hub. Uh, it's a huge connection point between East and West Coast. So it's perfectly reasonable that if you go to Atlanta, you're going to do a lot of, uh, a lot of damage. Now, this is not really evident because uh, here the time is a uh, universal time. Uh, but these flights are all, are, uh, all arriving in late afternoon, uh, uh, late morning, uh, early afternoon. So no problem here. If you go and we look at the opposite direction, instead, we find something that is quite strange. OK, we see a lot of Frankfurt. Lufthansa flights going to Frankfurt. And it is obvious. Frankfurt is one of the biggest airports in Europe. Lufthansa is the biggest airline in Europe. I know Ryanair is bigger, but they don't do connections, so they don't count. Uh, it's perfectly fine that we, that we see Lufthansa all the time. What is weird, at least 
for me it was, is that we say Copenhagen a lot of times, sometimes Oslo. And just a reminder, these are the 10 largest airports in Europe uh, in terms of traffic. Uh, so one thing that is surprising is that Heathrow, we don't see it. I mean, the, uh, the top the flight with the biggest impact, nobody of them is going to the biggest airport in Europe. Uh, Amsterdam, uh, East, Istanbul is not there, Amsterdam neither. Uh, so this uh, suggests that there is more than just the structure of connections. And uh, what is it? What is this more that is happening? Uh, one thing that you have to notice is that these flights are all arriving in the early morning. These ones are arriving in the, in the corresponding time zone. They are arriving much later. So the delay propagation trees that you start early in the morning clearly can go further because they, uh, they are not stopped artificially at the end of the day. And this is one thing. So this is one of the reasons why these trees are much bigger. But this still does not explain why I see a relatively minor airport that is always, uh, that is always there. The reason for that uh, is because of the structure of the schedules. Now let me go back. I am on time. Let me go back a bit. Uh, this is not, I mean, this is an actual tree uh, obtained from the simulations. I did not print one of the biggest ones uh, because it, it's, uh, I mean, you saw it, uh, uh, 500 uh, links, uh, it's going to be too big to fit on the screen. But this is actually one thing that we saw in the simulation. And here, highlighted in red, conveniently, is Amsterdam Airport. And here you see that delay comes back to Amsterdam quite often. One, two, and So this fact, the fact that you come back to your airport with delay and you keep going back and forward is actually one of the main drivers of the one of the main drivers of delay propagation. Uh, this is something which is in another paper. Here is another reference. Uh, I cannot guarantee that this is 100% correct in the sense that this idea that the flights with the worst impact are the ones that go back and forth is something that uh, we saw in uh, a limited subset of data. In, we have, uh, I think, one day in this paper, and this is for the US. And uh, there is uh, a similar analysis that we have done for Europe uh, in a couple of days. But in what we saw, those flights uh, are, the, are, the most, are the most important ones. And uh, Europe has more of those of those flights that go back and forth. Uh, you see here I have the fraction of returning flights. So returning means, of course, it's going to an airport where it has already been. And this fraction is much bigger in Europe, well, much bigger. It is significantly bigger in Europe than in the US. Uh, and correspondingly, also the fraction of delay that is carried by these flights uh, is higher. Uh, this is due mostly to uh, the structure of the system. In the sense that uh, in Europe, you typically have a small number, smaller number than the US, of operating bases. For example, uh, well, Ryanair, as usual, is an exception. They have, uh, I don't know how many, uh, but they don't contribute to this thing because they don't do connections. But for example, Alitalia, which is a big company, has two. Lufthansa, which is a big company, uh, I don't remember if they are two or three. Frankfurt, Munich, uh, uh, it's Frankfurt, Munich, and um, Berlin. Perfect. 
So since you have less of them, uh, clearly, and operations have to be done at your operating base, you have to increase in the planning of the schedule this, uh, this back and forth. And with this, uh, that is all. So time for questions. Uh, I am uh, surprising on time. Okay, thank you for your attention. Regarding Q rotation, I, perhaps I am wrong, tell me if I am wrong, but I remember some, some previous assault in which Q rotation was one of the most important. No, it was not. For, for release, was not. It was not, I mean, we have to define importance. I mean, now we know that is not really important because we implemented it into the model, we ran simulation, we tried to play with it, and we saw that it was not important. I did. You are right. Uh, I did a talk, it was about uh, two years ago, when I was listing the crew rotations as one important thing. But that was important because uh, uh, the people in the project wanted to implement them. And of course, like I said, if you, I mean, if you want to say that it's not important, you have to actually prove it. You have to implement it and see what the impact is. No, the, the crew rotations, what happens is that the, the two connections uh, into flights uh, in companies like Ryanair, they have to rotation. So it's that means that uh, the crew has to pass from one flight to another, and there are ways to delay can pass from one flight to another. Also, a question for curiosity. What would you think to what level of detail does one need to go in order really to be able to take the uh, Okay, there was a job let me, that there was. Let me, let, me, let me explain what I mean, for example. You said, okay, there's no surprise that, for example, Atlanta shows up on the US side so much. You say it's simply because it's one of the biggest. Just from my, my own experience, I would say there might be other factors. For example, Atlanta has the worst immigration system of all American airports. Because for example, no, there is no fast lane or fast track or anything. So if you arrive late, yeah. JFK or other places, you, you get guided through as passengers. But if you, you are connecting, Atlanta, connecting nothing in Atlanta, you wait one and a half hours. Okay. So I could think that such factors contribute as well. So, so but we have no control of them. Exactly. So so. I, what I was wondering, what, what do you think? So to, to what extent can you draw very general conclusions? Or to what extent is still much of the information hidden in such kind of... Uh, well, uh, there is something which I left out but for brevity. But actually, I mean, <coughs> the delays due to connection are actually moderated by the fact that we have a maximum waiting time. I mean, you will not wait for one hour if, no, you, you wait maximum one hour, but you will not wait five hours for one passenger because that is something which uh, simply doesn't happen in reality. So that is already a mitigating factor in the sense that what gives, and I mean, it's something that you also see in this example, which is quite representative. I mean, the trees are rather shallow. I mean, what gives you the big delay is the fact that you propagate lots of things. Not really the fact that uh, you are pro propagating a particular amount of delay. Also because this interacts with, uh, with the buffer times in the schedule and things like that. So it's very hard, at least in this configuration, it's very hard that you can say, OK, I can, I can propagate three hours of delay to another flight. So I mean, probably, yes, I mean, there are all kinds of effects also there is uh, taxing that you are not modeling, but I mean. So let me reformulate the question: How do airlines nowadays, today, create their own schedules? For example, do they already include certain factors by which they can optimize their own schedules, or yes. at least 
or are these schedules just based on general? No, 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 no. Uh, when there is money, when there is money at stake, there is no general. I think. <laughs> no, they take a lot of they, they take, of course, uh, lots of stuff into into account. Uh, a lot of that stuff, the stuff, of course, that we have uh, no hope of knowing because it's their their own private business. Uh, but I don't know if uh, specifically. No, uh, actually, you raise a good point. I don't know if this particular thing. Uh, is uh, is concerned. Uh, I can say that uh, usually you have rather. Uh, I mean, one factor of a scale is that the biggest factor in delay propagation is the one by aircraft. Passenger is uh, smaller. I think it's like uh, one third of or something like. From what I saw, uh, they typically do have uh, buffer times which are ample, except for some cases which are, but and I don't know how in the detail I can go with this criticism. Yeah, but, but the ones that are doing these things uh, with, uh, that he was telling about the schedules are usually Scandinavians. Okay, so it takes uh, responsibility. It, it, it means that uh, it's all this Scandinavian flash which we are from Istanbul and Stockholm to, to somewhere. And the flight was supposed to arrive and depart in five minutes. <laughs> and then, of course, I mean, you have to go down and uh, refill and these things, so it's not really true. But they are counting with the, the times are long, I and mean, the, the, the flight duration is relatively long, so they can retake uh, some of these uh, treatments. And, uh, and in many cases, this works. In some other cases, when they may have problems like this is Mr. Cole, then it's not true. And then the, the whole thing explodes in the, in the stuff. The, what you are asking about the, the, sp the specific details of the, of the thing, Probably they take into account, especially if you are considering uh, intercontinental flights, they have to take into account the time for passing costumes and, and all these things. Uh, but this is, uh, on those ones, the, the buffer times are probably bigger in the sense of, uh, at least when you are going to enter into an intercontinental flight, the, the time uh, since the aircraft arrives until the depart may be even half a day. So as I said, it's a long, it's a long process. But the, um, in the other side around, when you're coming inter intercontinental into to the internal uh, connection network of the, of the audience. In that one, maybe not so much. And in, in, some, in some parts, it's mostly because they invest in Atlanta, uh, especially Delta, which is the, the one that's operating there in the hub. Uh, they know that, for instance, if you want to go from there to, uh, to Boston, there are several flights to the So if you lose one, you will get into the, into the next one as a, as a typical reaction. Uh, but yeah, I mean, all those things, uh, they, they have it. They have it in the account. So they put it in the schedule in such a way that they are supposed to things are softer in the process. And then what we do is just to take the schedule without knowing exactly why they did it like that and try to test what happens when you introduce the process. But uh, in this case, uh, I mean, what we did was the difference between the passengers that are connected internally in the, in, in, uh, in the network and the ones that are coming from outside. There are different uh, alphas, so basically they are dropping different uh, process, but we are not having the account of the delays because of Um, but I'm a little bit confused about the table you saw because it seems there is an airline problem, right? So you have Delta, yeah, Delta, and Sub Scandinavian. Well, so these are the three airlines. And I will not say there. that there is a problem. But but what you saw is because what you see, is <laughs> well, irrespective of the airport, which also appears quite often, but in the, in the European case, it's Lufthansa and Scandinavia. We have been always in this, after this table. Yes. So that's the only one. It's, it's, a, it's an airline problem. So I mean, uh, and I will not. I mean, no, no. Jokes aside, I will not call it exactly a problem because I mean, this does not mean necessarily that they have a problem. This means that they have they have lots of stuff going on, and so they need to take special care in order to handle it. Whether they are doing that or not yeah. is something that we cannot only say well, from the. I market. insist. If, if, if they if they did something, so I will see more. Mixture of airlines for the same airport, right? That would be more than something that they have. Uh, well, I would expect, but that doesn't happen in, in any of them. And so it has a little bit. Yeah, no, I mean, if, if Atlanta is a problem with immigration, so I suppose that Delta, they know that, and they will increase the buffer time. For yes. Example, they will do something. But apparently, there is always the same airlines 
which appear in the in the yeah, there, there, there is a, yeah. there is something else Scandinavian and and, and the fans are together in, in uh, so it's only one <laughs> 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 and the third thing is the only and the third thing is I don't understand why Copenhagen which is a small airport compared with other European airports and there's the uh, but but as as they as have as many more connections to as, as soon as you have a problem in Copenhagen it goes to to, yeah, to Frankfurt but if you have a problem in Frankfurt, it goes not only to Copenhagen, to many other airports. Yes, yes, yes. So there should yep. have more effect on that. And if you well, have a problem in Hebron, similar. Yes, so, so, uh, I don't, so it's not the problem of the connections, it's not the problem of the people who want to Copenhagen no, compared to, to other airports. It's a problem so, of, the, of the scheduling of these companies uh, and, and the fact that they are together. So no, I would say that uh, for uh, Scandinavian, it's the schedule. For Lufthansa, it's the connections. Well, yes, yes. And they, uh, of course, like you said, they interact. So you so confirm that it's a problem of error? Of the way that they treat the, the, the real delays and what they do when they have this problem uh, is a different story. I mean, we don't know that. But we can calculate this with the, which have the flights that can be most impactful in the, in the network, and then if they are really around, uh, the most impactful depends on how they react to them. Yeah, I mean, you can, I mean, if you have this kind of if you have this kind of situation, you can prevent it easily, let's say, just by cutting here. You say, okay, this flight is coming late, but I am at my operating base, I have a spare aircraft, so I don't care anymore about the aircraft, it's going to do whatever he wants, whatever he wants. It's going to arrive when it can arrive, and now the next flight is going to be operated by a different aircraft. So this is a kind of special measure of the thing, and uh, in that case, you you have completely prevented the situation, but there is a cost to that. So the idea is that on one side you have the cost of performing the action, on the other you have what is going to happen if you don't do anything. So there should be a balance between the two things. Which, uh, I mean, there are people who actually calculate these things. Uh, if you want to calculate it at the, really at the euro dollar level uh, you cannot do simulations uh, which are network wide uh, the people who actually do uh, this cost analysis uh, they usually focus on one airport or one airline uh, one day of data and they do something which is super detailed and well, for me it's interesting uh, I don't know for, for the audience here but I mean we are kind of balancing that idea, that approach, my opinion, with something that is more uh, network-wide, more general. I have a question regarding the, the cast question that you showed that these return flights, and yes. between the US and, and Europe, and uh, you say that this is because in US companies have more hubs than in Europe, which in general is true, but still, uh, in Europe there are many companies, and in the US there is much less companies. So at the very end, if you treat the whole system as a, as a whole, the number of hubs in Europe is much larger than in the US. Well, I mean, in, Europe, Europe, in Europe there is at least one hub per country. At least one. And in some countries more than one. Yes, but... And in the US they have five, I mean, ten big hubs, and that's it. All together, all the companies, that's it. So, so uh, I, I, I just don't, don't understand this difference in structure. And, 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 and the other question is, are you counting returning flights if they are done by the same plane? Or yes. Are you? Okay, so then it's not a matter of having the flights, it's a matter of how you schedule the planes. So that means that in Europe, the plane, the plane that does Palma Madrid, does Palma Madrid, Palma Madrid, yes. Palma Madrid all the day, and in the US it does Palma, Madrid, Rome, uh, uh, I don't know, yes. Helsinki, uh, Frankfurt, Madrid. It's like that, no? Yeah. I mean, it's what I wanted to express. Uh, so it's, it not, wasn't clear. it's not a matter of the number of hubs. It's a matter of how the flight between a hub and another destination is scheduled. If it is like a bus that goes on back. Yes, uh, but I think. Uh, uh, yes, yes, I yeah, think it's, that. It can be, I mean, you know, the other side is uh, Madrid, Palma, it can be Madrid. Uh, Palma, eh, Madrid, uh, Bilbao, Madrid. Uh, but but, but it has to be Madrid, Palma, Madrid to be counted. Uh, and this is what yes, this is what is happening in Europe that in the US doesn't happen. 
Yeah. 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 Because the flags are jumping around instead of, so it's not a matter of number of hats, it's a matter of for you one, the, 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 the jumps basically. But, but this is intrinsically for the European network because of Or maybe it's a... Uh, yeah, it's a fire line, a lot of, a lot of a single type system. There's an overlap of echo networks of the single... Uh, yeah, but, but a, co a company, uh, take an take example you want, for instance, I don't know, uh, a national company. You have fly from Hobbes to Hobbes Madrid, and they fly to Mallorca. Uh, but they also fly from Mallorca to, ba to Barcelona, for instance, or they might fly... No, no, no. So they go back to Madrid. They go back to Madrid, so they, they don't, they separate companies, they separate fly, they... Unless you have things like, uh, I mean, in, in the alliances, uh, you may have different things, like, for instance, with uh, here, with Boeing, Boeing has the base in, in Barcelona, so uh, you have uh, Barcelona, Palma, back and forth, back and forth, somewhere else, but uh, back to Barcelona, and Iberia is doing the Madrid, uh, Palma, back and forth, back and forth, and they are more or less in the same thing, so you can connect from one to another, if you want to be really neat, but, uh, but in most cases, they, uh, even if they are in the same alliance, they are relatively isolated, so they have created their own network, and they have created so, so the fact that the European system is like a component of many subsystems. So uh, almost, I think it's twice as much uh, earnings in Europe as in the US. So it's okay. it was, uh, uh, 80 versus 40 or the US. Uh, no, I remember that we did that, uh, but I don't remember the numbers. So at least a factor two in the number of companies uh, that so organize their own networks. So it's always going to decentralize the flights. Uh, the flights are centralized the teams. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Well, this ah, yes, yes. You you the people, the people do connections, but uh, they don't set it uh, connected. So essentially, if, if you lose the connection, it's that you lose the connection. I just bought two tickets which are six hours apart f with Ryanair, so <laughs> I don't know if it's a general solution. <laughs> <laughs> Any other question? Well, thanks, uh, Bruno.